Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Aaron Trotman of Non. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Cameron. I appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to start out with your upbringing. Uh, where did you grow up, and what would you say your childhood was like? Um, I grew up in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, that is now quite gentrified and really cool, but at the time it wasn't uh, when I was growing up. And then when I started high school, we moved out to the country. So um, probably about 90 minutes out of the city. Um, mm. And then I spent my teenage years up there. Um, from that point, uh, I, as soon as I could, I left the country and I got back down to Melbourne, um, back to the city and mm. uh, haven't, haven't looked back since. Um, my upbringing um, was, uh, it was an interesting one. Um, my family didn't have uh, a lot of money. Um, I got to go to a, a school, uh, a good school um, in high school. Um, I was very lucky to do that. My, my parents struggled um, mm. to put me into that school um, as well as my brother and sister. Um, and, you know, it set me up with some good discipline and, and good principles um, yeah. for, for the future. Um, at the detriment to themselves, um, which I'm extremely grateful for. Mm. Um, so, yeah. I love it. So growing up, what were some of your, your interests and aspirations, uh, any entrepreneurial activities, athletics, creative? What, what was that growing up like for you? Um, I always really liked music. Um, mm. And I think I liked I liked reading and um, and doing... I liked drawing as a kid for sure, but uh, I wasn't very good at it. So I kind of left that, um, alone. And then, um, through my early years of high school, uh, I would got into creative. So, um, I was quite good at like the graphic design courses and everything. Um, but then I thought that it would be really cool to be a stockbroker. So I, I changed it all up and went to legal and economics and, uh, I hated that. Um, so then I end up switching again, um, to, uh, <laughs> to doing like biology and chemistry. And I didn't like that either. Cause I thought I wanted to be a physiotherapist. <laughs> um, and I studied that for about six months when I finished school. So we finished school here at 18 and, uh, mm -hmm. I dropped out of that uh, pretty quickly yeah. to be honest with you. Um, but I also like sports. I played a high level of Australian rules football, um, here through, um, through high school. Um, yeah. and then. It didn't really go on anywhere else from that. I, I, I sort of did a year um, afterwards, uh, but uh, leaving the mateship that I had at uh, school with that team, um, it didn't really resonate with me anymore. Um, yeah. And there was some um, probably some pressure from um, my stepdad to um, play at a high level and do, the, do those things and end up having sort of a bad sort of connection to it. Um, by the mm. time I turned 18, so I was like, Ah, no more sport. Um, I don't even watch Australian rules football anymore. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So what did that shift look like for you? So after 18 years old, did you end up going to a university? I know eventually you went on to RMIT University. So what did this section look like for your academics and your, your career journey? So um, I went and studied uh, physiotherapy for six months. Um, yeah. I dropped out of that and uh, I moved to Melbourne um, and I loved house music. So I actually uh, became a DJ wow. um, and I did that full time for about 10 years. Um, so doing that was really interesting because um, I learned how hospitality works in ways, but I also worked out how um, you as a person are responsible for your own brand. Um, yeah. and it's it's not as much about what you're good at. It's about the relationships that you can build and develop. And that's what I, I learned from there. And uh, yeah. one of my business partners in Non, um, who's based in LA actually, um, he's also come from that world as well. Um, and the way you have your marketing and your sales reps and everything is not too dissimilar to how a nightclub would run um, having hosts and getting people to come down and using drink cards and yeah. pouring liquid on lips in the drinks world is not too dissimilar from drink cards and getting people to be advocates for your venue and bring bring their friends down and tell their friends about it. So it's yeah. really interesting that the crossover of the actual ins and outs of the world, of, mm. of that world that make, that make it tick and work. Um, and then 
uh, that lifestyle is unhealthy to say the least. Um, mm. So I just, I decided to go back to uni and do marketing um, and I didn't finish it. Uh, I, I did 27 of the 32 subjects um, and I started a men's cosmetics brand um, and that's subsequently why I didn't finish it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that there were things in the marketing degree that were definitely helpful. Um, just some foundational principles and everything. Um, yeah. But there's nothing like learning on the job. Yeah, for sure. I think what's interesting about your career is you've, you've been really a founder and entrepreneur since day one of like, even with personal branding through your DJ career, but kind of post university, I know you, you got into this brand as well that you mentioned. So what did that section of your life look like then when you eventually you were close to the end, but then you, you moved on from school and took this full time at what stage was the company and what were you guys selling at that point? For the cosmetics brand? Yeah. Cosmetics. Yeah. So, um, I met my wife and, uh, she was like, Oh, I really want you to grow a beard. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. No worries. Um, so I did, um, keep, keep, <laughs> keep her happy. And, um, it was because I was using products uh, for, for beard related products. I was like, I think I can make something better than this. So I'm just going to go buy some essential oils and, and some, some base oils and make something myself in the kitchen. Mm. Uh, so I did that and then I needed to find a contract manufacturer. Um, so, uh, and then they introduced me to, uh, another gent. Um, his name is Richie Ganano, um, who's sadly no longer with us, who became a mentor to me. Um, but he created the original, um, ESOP formulations um and kevin murphy if if you've heard of them yeah. who's, um i think they're quite big in the in the u.s now but yeah. australian brands um and he taught me a lot about formulation formulation science how it works how things can get thrown out um you might have a great base but then you throw something else in and the whole formula you've got to throw mm. it away and you've got to start again um and then during that time as well starting to getting ingrained in a new industry I started to meet barbers and then I thought it was a really good opportunity to do shops. Um, mm. So uh, the first one was with my cousin um, and that was uh, about two hours out of the city um, in Ballarat, was the place is called. And okay. we built a barbershop in Ballarat, bringing that Melbourne product to um, a country town. Um, mm. And that went really well. And then we did another one, did another one. And then we had about five of those at, wow. at one point. Um, and that was probably from going, so the cosmetics brand never really did anything. Um, yeah. it wasn't a money maker. It was a learning, uh, tool and exercise, yeah. uh, to say the least. Um, but the stores were really helpful because it helped me to manage staff and then it got me closer to working at P&L and running finances and all those sorts of things as well. Mm. Um, and then, um, during COVID, uh, I was like, oh, cause I didn't have a sandwich shop, a deli near my house. I was like, oh. Yeah. I really want a sandwich shop near my house. So I decided to go build one of those. Um, and then I cut my teeth even more in hospitality. So I understand the pressures of uh, running the P&L, how hard it is to make money off food, you make your money on drinks and all those sorts yeah. of things, um, how to use wages efficiently. Um, and, and the cost associated with hospitality business is really huge. So yeah, I kind of had a go at a lot of different things um, to learn about them. Um, I've always just followed my gut. If I think it's a good idea, I just go out and do it and I'll figure out a way to make it work. For sure. Um, and try to do it as cheap as possible. Yeah. I'd love to kind of hear the inspiration behind the sandwich shop. Um, and I, I saw your background. It, it was Stan's Deli. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So yep. yeah. What le led the shift to the sandwich shop then and your interest in food in general? I've always had the interest in food. I've always been a, a diehard foodie that spends far too much money. Uh, money on food <laughs> and going out. Um, and then the sandwich shop, again, it was just, I, f I felt like the area that I live in um, needed it. Um, there's a great place in Melbourne called Hector's Deli, um, which is doing really well and quite and quite famous. Um, and it was just basically premium, um, premium level sandwiches uh, to my area. Mm. Um, so that was the main inspiration, but also just doing nice things really simply but with like there's always that one little x factor um yes just, uh, and make, making things accessible to people so they didn't have to travel mm -hmm. 
At what point uh, did that company go to? Um, was it you said you started out of your own place, the the sandwich shop? What what did that function and operation look like from the start and scaling from there? With the sandwich shop, um, that was yeah. just around the corner, so so it wasn't a, it wasn't on scale. Um, it yeah. actually ultimately failed. Um, it's okay. getting rebuilt now at the moment, um, but it was good for a couple of years. Um, yeah. So this has all been running coinciding with non but non is my my focus and, and where i spend most of my time yeah for sure and as as we navigate into non i know the founding kind of starts in 2019 and it's inspired with you and your wife your travel your passion for food um can we kind of get into that story and what, what does that inspiration look like for non non-alcoholic beverages sure so um during it was 2017 um when we went to london um mm -hmm. and we were eating and exploring. Um, we did a food tour in Paris, a walking tour with um, someone we got recommended, um, used to be in Melbourne actually. Um, and that was really incredible because it was like, hey, this alley down the back of here has the best baguette in Paris. You know, just things that you would not know and find out. And that's yeah. right up my alley, finding those hidden gems in cities um, and that local knowledge. So the dinner where I, realized non-alcoholic pairings and temperance pairings as they're called in restaurants um, mm -hmm. depending on the restaurant um, was really incredible at Clove Club so I got the wine pairing my wife got the non-alcoholic pairing um, and there was one pairing that came over um, it was a port and uh, to be polite I didn't enjoy it very much so I grabbed <laughs> my wife's drink at that time and uh, I was like, oh, I understand this. This is delicious. And it goes really well with the food. I get this. And then yeah. throughout the rest of the meal, um, I was always stealing her drinks and trying them um, alongside my wine pairing. I was like, this is, this is really cool. Like, there's something in this. Um, and then, so that was 2017, 2018, and, and uh, coming back to Melbourne. And then still going out for the same level of meal. Uh, we don't have Michelin stars in Australia. They're called hats um, from the Good Food Guide. Yep. Um, and getting those pairings, well, Miranda was, um, and I was like, these drinks are cool. Like, I like it. Um, and there was one particular meal was in South Melbourne at, at a place called Lume, um, and Orlando Marzo was there at the time. Um, and he's one of the world class. And he mm -hmm. was on the non-alcoholic pairings, and those things are crazy. And they were yeah. really, really good and, and cool. And then <clears throat> I just got the lease on the new factory um, and I was painting it um, and I had a friend go, oh, my brother's hasn't got work at the moment. Uh, he's just closed his restaurant. Um, can you got some work for him? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, you can help me paint. And then um, I was like, I was like, hey, have you heard of these drinks? Like, you know, um, I don't know why you can't buy that level of drink in a bottle. Like if the best restaurants in the world are making these drinks in house themselves, not using alcohol and wine, it's like, it's gotta be something in it. Yeah. Um, and then he was like, yeah, I've heard of them. I, I've made them before. And I was like, oh, great. We'll make three. And if we've got three, then great. Like there's a business there. Um, yeah. so yeah, end up on a contract basis. I had the chef help me out. And obviously I'm not a chef. I don't have a culinary background, but I can get businesses off the ground and get them running. Um, yeah. and I had no idea about non alk. I just thought it was a good idea. I followed my gut. Um, yeah. and it turns out was, there was a huge need for restaurants for this. And it turned mm. out, and I didn't know at this time, it turned out that they're very expensive to make. They're very laborious to make. They're kind of a bit of a pain in people's ass to make. Yeah. So they're like, Oh, this is cool. This is cool. And then it just, it just went off from there. Um, so that was the start of the alternative wine wow. category out of here in Australia. It's incredible. So what did the R and D process look like with formulating with the, the, the chef that you had on board at that time? What, what did that look like? Taste testing from your point of view, shifting flavors, sourcing, um, mm -hmm. that process. So it was the development, um, but working with a chef was somewhat difficult to, get their head out of it's not a pinch of salt in this game yeah it's it's going to be really like uh, what's the one i'm looking for be really like uh, accurate with weighing things yeah. um and then all of the ingredients they really matter because they're because of real 
using real produce is if you're using things out of season or you're using a particular style of version, you couldn't just change them. So to try to like break the mold of that and to like get it get in the head was really difficult and challenging. Um, and the first iterations are great. And then it all went out the window and I was like, mm. what's happened here? And I've invested all this money into the branding and everything. And I was like, uh Oh, I'm in deep trouble here. So I got my cosmetics formulas and I said, right, get in the kitchen. We're going to do about 70 iterations of these things. And we're going to try different suppliers. And then once we got them, then we're going to go, okay, cool. What well, can they supply? Can this thing scale? Mm. Um, how big are these companies? Do, if they are too big, do they even want to work with us? Like how, mm. how is this even going to happen? Um, how do we manage inventory to make sure it doesn't get out of, out of hand? Um, yeah. And then there's obviously all the cost of it um, of trying to figure out just buying bottles and labels and, you know, equipment. So it started mm. in a 20 litre pot with like, beer kegs and you know a free for free off the trading post um yeah well, it wasn't free or 75 dollars, but it was so hard to get out of the guy's um old convenience store <laughs> that he gave it to <laughs> us for free um and yeah the, that was just how we had to build it up um mm. and then the business got far more sophisticated um and we needed people who had worked in bulk liquids so we got someone from yeah. dia at that point then we needed someone that was really like knew the molecularness of, of products um, and yes. got a food scientist in and then, uh, then, then cocktail makers and just a range yeah. of people bringing in new ideas as the business evolved and developed and then we upgrew things and people and all those sorts of things. But um, yeah, everyone's been crucial along the way in the journey. Wow. Yeah, it was such a complex supply chain of kind of like, a team behind the product development you need to craft such a an elegant product where did you you find some of these key contacts and did you have like an advisor at this time i know you didn't have the background yourself in formulation so i mean scientists chefs who helped you with that um the, the first food scientist we used was a consultant i can't remember how we got her details um Maybe it was talking to a bottling facility or something where we got it from. Um, yeah. Or maybe a Google search. Um, but they helped go, right, you've got concept, but this is how you get a shelf stable. This is what you use to do this. These are all yeah. the things you need to look out for. This is how you create a nutritional panel that's, you mm. know, up to code so you don't get in trouble. Um, yeah. There were, there were all those things. Um, and... It's just digging, it's just speaking to people, asking people, Hey, you've got a brand. What have you, what have you done? And then, you know, people come and ask me those same things now. And I'm just like, I'll speak to this person. I'll speak to that person and mm -hmm. always happy to help. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious, um, behind the flavors at launch, what kind of led to that flavor launch that line? Uh, because I know it's super crucial to come out with something that's that can complement the meal that they're going with, or it's an elegant drink to go with, and especially non-alcoholic. So. What inspired the flavors at launch? Um, they were just delicious. Honestly, it wasn't yeah. like trend leading flavors. Um, <laughs> it was three products. So it was, it was non one, two, and three. Um, yeah. That were gotten to a place where we were like, okay, these are cool drinks. Let's just get them out there and start showing people. Um, mm. and then people started ordering straight away. Um, there wasn't any, again, market research, rhyme or reason behind it. Um, it just turned out to yeah. be, it had the right balance and the balance was enough. So, yeah. um, getting the, getting the key markers of wine down, being fruit, tannin, salt, and acid, being able to hit mm -hmm. those, um, yeah. in a really unique way, um, just it, it, it filled a need and a want at the time. And it still yeah, does. For sure. for sure. Uh, when I was in LA, I brought up that, um, there, there was a, a shop there that was actually just all non-alcoholic drinks. And it was like a, a center for networking. You can go have a non-alcoholic drink and just connect with people. From your point of view, um, you're in the industry yourself. Why do you think non-alcoholic beverages are on the rise in the past few years? I think COVID accelerated it for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's a big one. Social media is obviously a huge one as well. Um, this perception on social media, we live our life through the screen. Um, if you want a job, you can be searched on so many platforms um, during a recruitment process as well. 
Um, a lot more information is coming out about how bad alcohol is for you. You know, you've got people like Daniel Huberman, who's obviously ginormous, who's pushing this message as well. Yeah. Um, and that, with the audience being so large in America, is why it's probably getting accelerated as quickly as what it is as well. Um, yeah. And while I think consumers are probably up to speed in the better for you um, lifestyle, I think restaurants are starting to get there as well, starting to see that they need, they need to, they need to cater for it. Um, yeah. Because we see this in Australia that if you don't have your online menus updated, um, it's kind of similar to what vegan and vegetarians are dealing with for five, six years ago. Um, yeah. if you know, most options are transferable on the menu now. Um, mm -hmm. and they need to do that with non-alc as well. Um, yeah. So I think that's probably the main reason and starting to kick off. Um, I yeah. think also it's just that millennials are actually getting older as well. So they've got more disposable income. Um, they've started to have children. So they start mm -hmm. to look at these options just as much. Um, and then Gen Z aren't really drinking at all. Um, yeah. They're not entering the category. Um, it's got that whole punk thing about, punk thing about it where it's just like my my parents did that. That's not cool. I'm not doing it. Mm. Um, yeah. so, so there's a bit of that, but also film and, and Hollywood's helping that as well. So I just found this out a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was interesting that in movies when smoking didn't become cool, so the Marlboro Man wasn't a hero anymore and the bad guys started smoking. So they helped push it along. And now only mm. bad guys in movies drink and heroes don't drink. They're not showing yeah. drinking. So there's a lot of cultural stuff happening at the moment that is accelerating this. Yeah. And how do you guys as a brand kind of dive into uh, what you see culture shifting with your marketing? What, what works uh, marketing wise for non-alcoholic beverage space? I think that, well, what we do is we just, we just really lean into the transparency of the ingredients that we're using um, and, yeah. and the real produce that we're using as well. Um, and I think that is, the consumer at, the, at this stage is really well informed um, mm -hmm. and they have access to a lot of information um, and they want to know what's going into their body, um, especially these early adopters. Um, so for us, what works in, in, in the marketing, in the marketing scape is literally just what we do and just talking yeah. about it because we have nothing to hide. Um, yeah. We're not using flavor house ingredients um, that says natural flavors, but you know, what does that actually mean? Um, yeah. You know, so that's what we're doing and that's, and that's what we're leaning into and that's what's resonating with the, with the consumers. Um, we mm. also have 0.0%. So we don't create any alcohol in the process whatsoever. Um, yeah. While it's called an, alter an alternative wine, um, it is, an, is the name is a little conflicting in ways because it's, well, it's not a wine either but also yeah. you need to give someone a jumping off point as well. So sure. the biggest challenge in marketing is leaning into these wine occasions in the wine space, but also saying, hey, there's a different way to consume something in a wine glass and have it with food at that point in time. Mm. Interesting. I feel like this is a perfect segue into, you kind of answered some of it, but diversifying non from the competitors in your space, what would you say really does differentiate? not i know it's kind of transparency ingredients what else mm -hmm. i think it's flavor um yeah we're not taking we're not subtracting we're adding um yeah we're building we're building new things um we're not i've always deeply believed that if you non wouldn't be a gateway um to going back to alcohol if you had an issue with it um yeah and that's by giving you a totally new experience altogether so then you're not missing out. You're just having something brand new. Um, yeah. And I think that that is uh, respected by our consumers. And mm -hmm. there's a need for a lot of different things in, in this category, um, whether it be a spirit or an alcohol remove wine. It depends what you're looking for um, yeah. in that moment in time. Um, so for us, differentiation is just like, again, owning what we do um, yeah. and, and, using, and using the premium ingredients that we do and paying our staff a fair wage and doing all those sorts of things. Certainly. Yeah. Can we get into kind of like what the team structure and supply chain internally looks like now? So uh, where are you guys manufacturing? Are you guys holding inventory, shipping from a warehouse, a 3PL? 
what does the operations look like for now and today? So we've just finished our HQ cellar door um, in May, and we, we now invite guests to come down. So we have monthly awesome. tour visits. Um, so we make everything ourselves. Um, by And we have four guys, uh, chefs in the wow. kitchen that do all of that. Um, it's all exactly the same way as when we started, as I said earlier. Um, it's just we had to customize bigger equipment or build our own things uh, custom yeah. to make sure we can supply and make everything that we do, but in the same way that we always have. Um, yeah. So we will, we go, we're going out at the moment um, and getting all our new vintage of things. So whether that be yeah. for raspberries um, mm -hmm. or for the oranges that we're using next year to the Verju that we're buying for the, for the next year. So mm -hmm. that's the start of the supply chain. So we start there. Yeah. And then, we, and then we draw down on that stock from our suppliers um, and, and then we start to process them. So we don't add any preservatives, but if we do preserve them, we do it through method. So whether it be dehydration or freeze drying or any of those sorts of things. Um, so then monthly, uh, we make it uh, for our orders essentially. Um, yeah. So we have an 18 month shelf life, which is pretty good in this space. Um, yeah. But also we want to make sure that we keep that stock as fresh as, as fresh as possible. Um, we're at a point now from building a new facility and having three to four years at this now that we can get the product very consistent, um, especially mm -hmm. in our core range of one, three and seven. Um, so, and that's just helps from being able to have a little bit more cash, being able to buy more inventory um, and being able to hold that inventory, which is obviously quite hard. So we would hold that yeah. in the warehouse. Um, that warehouse also does all our D2C fulfillment here in Australia. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we're making stuff for Japan, Korea, Singapore. Um, wow. And then the US is our own company. So we're the importer into the US. Um, wow. And then we on, uh, then we're on sell it to distributors there. So uh, the stock will land um, at Park Street up in Oakland. Um, yeah. And then we'll on sell it to Southern and Union in New York. Um, mm. And... We will start shipping directly to New York, but we can't at the moment because the temperatures are too cold to so the product can freeze. And uh, I've definitely learned that lesson the hard way with the container blowing up um, for shipping wow. during winter <laughs> to the East Coast. <laughs> um, so that's essentially how it works. And then we've just launched the UK last week. So very mm. soft, talking to restaurants and everything at the moment. And we've got product on the way there as well. So we will be yeah. the importer into the UK for the time being and then build up the reputation and we'll talk to a larger distributor. That's the same that's happened with the US as well. Yeah, incredible. What does the percentages breakdown look like for D to C, uh, retail, restaurant? What does that kind of sales look like today? Um, in Australia, I think our D to C makes up about 10 to 15% of our volume. Okay. Um, and then the US is about the same. Um, yeah. D to C is very difficult at the moment. It's, it's, it's really expensive. Um, For sure. And we haven't really worked too much with the US at, at this point, like on what the unlock is and what, and what the customer values are and really trying to get under the skin of that. Um, mm. You know, we haven't played on Amazon even uh, yet. Um, yeah. Most of our product goes out to, to retailers and to restaurants. Um, so we're about 60% on-premise being anywhere you can buy by the glass, which would be a restaurant, bar, wine bar, whatever mm. it is. And then off premise yep. makes up the other forty percent. So that'd be from grocery to independent wine stores or um, you know uh, delis, those sorts yeah. of things as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, regarding expansion into retail and restaurants, what does that look like for your guys' point of view? Do you have a lot of inbound requests coming in, or do you guys have a sales team outbound that are pitching, looking for those locations? What does that look like? So. The distributors are good because they, they, they can be a sales arm if you use them effectively. Um, For sure. And then you have more of some, you become more of a marketing company in ways. Yeah. So um, they're called brand ambassadors generally who, yeah. who work on your rate of sale. Um, I call them market managers. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't really like the term brand ambassador because it's a bit too Instagram-y for me. So we call I them agree. market managers. Yeah, um, <laughs> So we have three market managers in Australia in the three key states, um, and we'll be adding two more next year with a head of sales in Australia as well. So head of sales mm -hmm. is ma managing the national accounts um, and yep. managing distributors as well. Um, mm -hmm. 
in the US, uh, we have someone in New York, we have someone in LA, um, and then we have a sales force as well that we share with another brand and then six reps with them as well and a head of sales mm. um, in, in the US too and a brand manager on the ground uh, in the US and we have a brand manager in Australia. But our marketing directors and sales directors and all that is based out of Australia uh, with yeah. me and operations directors and all those sorts of things. And then through Japan and Singapore and everything, um, we've just put on an agency to help us out with uh, through APAC. So awesome. if we were a UK brand, Europe would be our APAC. Um, APAC making yep. up like Korea, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, yep. Malaysia, all those sorts of places. Mm -hmm. So non needs help in helping the consumers understand it and also the staff to like be confident in selling it as well when they yep. get to the table. Um, so that's really our prime focus in doing it and then working with the distributors and, and showing value mm -hmm. and, and why it's worth their time. Certainly. What, what is the top seller uh, that you're seeing like in the past few years that they're trending uh, flavor? Why do you think that is as well? Don one uh, is our top seller. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny that it's non one as well, but <laughs> it just is. Um, it's salted raspberry and chamomile. So mm. I think it's very approachable. It's very easy to understand. It's sparkling. So it's, it's a bit of fun. Um, I think that uh, if you're probably brand switching or looking for alternatives to alcohol, then, um, you know, our main demographic is uh, millennial females. Um, and, you know, the rose, it's, it's an alternative to rose. So, I think okay. it's an easy, I think it's an easy shortcut. Um, yeah. some of our more, um, uh, let's say weird skews in a way, um, being a beetroot and Sancho doesn't sell very well in the off premise. It sells really well in the on premise, which is like food led and sommelier led venues. Um, mm. preferably it's like small and, and the Somme's, um, walking around and, and an owner as well. But, yeah. um, those in the off premise just, don't work because unless someone explains it to you or you sample it, um, they're like, Ooh, Beecher and Sancho. No, thanks. I'll get the raspberry and chamomile. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds like something I understand. So yeah. that's sells 50% of our global volume. Um, it's very consistent everywhere and how much of that moves. Yeah. Um, and then non three toasted cinnamon yuzu is our second best seller. Um, again, it's easy to probably understand. Um, yeah. and use is really popular flavor. Um, that wasn't by design. It was just the right flavor to work at the time during the product development. Um, and then stewed cherry and coffee as well. Um, so that's going really well for us too. Um, it just depends as well. It depends on the climate. So yeah. let's say on the, on the West coast, um, non three, well, LA and San Diego. Non three is more popular because it's a bit fresher and a bit brighter. But then where it gets a little bit colder up in San Fran, stew cherry and coffee is really popular. And the same through New York. Um, yeah. And then we see the same where Melbourne's got that climate of, let's say, San Francisco. And then Sydney's got more LA um, yeah. type weather. So it's, it just depends on the climate. And, you know, people want their drinks to be refreshing, essentially. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we, we see, we see it change a little bit city to city, um, but it, everything's pretty consistent. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So Aaron, I like to conclude each episode with this. Um, if you can share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, maybe something you've learned or regret along the way, what would you say that would be? I would say just, this sounds really cheesy, but like, honestly, just go for it and trust your gut. Yeah. Um, I actually fell back into this trap um, maybe like six months ago that don't look at what anyone else is doing. Like don't look at your yeah. competitors um, because what they do is they make you reactionary and then you're not yeah. leading. So you always want to be leading. If you want to win, you've got to lead. Um, mm. And I definitely think a big one for me um, that I, I don't hear many other people say is like looking at your competitors is basically like not, not a very good idea. But again, I, yeah. fell, in that, I fell in that trap. So uh, and now I'm not doing it. And now, now I'm having really good ideas and like thought leadership again. So, um, yeah, go with your gut. Don't, and, and if you think it's a good idea, try it out and then don't look at what anyone else is doing because your idea is your own idea and create that universe of your own idea. I love it. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for uh, joining me today and to the listeners out there, make sure to check out non at us.non.world.